How's everyone today? Good. You guys made it all safely, I hope. Right? We don't have just a mangled up car out in the parking lot right now. And so, <laughs> well, good. I'm glad that you're here. We'll uh, we'll continue to quietly pray uh, for those that are driving still um, that they'll uh, be here safely. But uh, let's go ahead and get started. Let's go ahead and start singing praises to our Lord. I'm going to open in prayer. Father God, thank you that we can come here and worship you. Lord, we know we can worship you anywhere. But God, it is such an awesome thing to come into a fellowship with other believers who love you. God, I pray as we sing these songs and as we take communion and as we hear from your word, that we would just grow closer to you, that our love for you would grow. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and sing with us, Great Are You, Lord. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Sing it out, church. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise you only great are you Before we read this, uh, sing this next song, I want to read to you John 8, 
verses 31 uh, to 36, it says, So Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Verse 36, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Amen? Amen. Let's sing who you say I am. The sun sets free, oh, is free again. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Free at last, He has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Through the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. The sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Yes, Father, we are your children. You love when we call you Father. Lord, I pray as we take communion now, as we hear from your word, that we will come to you as excited children, for you've sacrificed your son for us. You've given us your word. You have given us the spirit. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Now I'll make my way down here. <laughs> so if the men would come forward. All right, so uh, today, just to kind of give you guys a heads up about what we're doing for the service today, uh, we're going to do communion, uh, and then I'm going to share my message, and then, uh, oh, there'll be light. Um, and then afterwards, we're going to do a time of uh, praises or prayers uh, that, we want, that we can share with each other. Um, so we'll have a microphone going around. Um, so if you want to start thinking about it now, maybe you're like, oh, yes, I got something right away. Um, I've been hearing from some people that they've been wanting to do this for weeks. Uh, and so I'm like, all right. Well, let's do it. And so uh, we will do that after the message today. That's how we're going to close our service. Um, so if you want to uh, share a prayer request maybe or share a praise um, for something that God is doing in your life, 
uh, you can begin thinking about it and uh, plan for that. Well, uh, today we have communion, um, and I love taking communion. Uh, I think it's an, it's an awesome uh, privilege, but also opportunity that we have to reflect on our Savior. I was reminded uh, earlier this week uh, some details about communion. Uh, and I think it's something that we maybe kind of forget because we're not Jewish and we didn't grow up with that tradition, but also we've done communion so often. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in my message, so I don't want to spoil that. Uh, but uh, I was listening to a pastor friend, okay, he had his sermon on YouTube, uh, and he said his son, I believe he's in fifth or sixth grade, uh, they're reading through the Bible together. And so they're in the book of Leviticus, and uh, he was reading through the book of Leviticus, right? Dick's already smiling over here, and he's like, yep, that's a crazy, <laughs> that's an interesting book for a fifth grader for sure, right? Um, and he's reading through it, and he looks up at his dad, and he, and he says, dad, aren't you so happy, aren't you so excited that we don't have to do this anymore? And his dad was like thinking about it and sort of shocked by his response, and he's like, probably not as excited as, as I should be. And that, that, that made me think. I was like, how excited are we that we don't have to go through all those laws anymore? So I read through the book of Leviticus, well, not through the whole book, but through a bunch of chapters uh, in the book of Leviticus over this week. Uh, and it's pretty gruesome. Right? The first few books of the Bible, especially when, when God is, is, is telling his people how to, to, to make sacrifices, right? how to cleanse certain things, how to purify certain things, there's a lot of gruesome, gory things that happen. Uh, every, every chance I've had this week, whether it's at the school uh, where I teach Bible classes or there's a homeschool group that I teach a Bible class as, as well, I've been pointing this out to them uh, because none of us have grown up in the tradition where we make sacrifices for our sin, right? Uh, even the Jewish people today, they don't do that. And so it's hard for us when we read these passages to maybe get a grip at what this was like. And so some of the passages talk about slicing the throats of animals, putting the blood on your hands, putting it on the altar, putting it on another animal, doing these things that are pretty graphic. And I'm excited that we don't have to do that. Because in the book of Luke, we read about a Passover event. We read about a Passover. And so in Luke chapter 22... Verse 19, it says, And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That Passover was the last Passover that, an, that a sacrifice was made to please God. Now, there were doubtless sacrifices that happened after that day, but none of them were pleasing to God because that last sacrifice was the only sufficient sacrifice that we would ever need again. And that sacrifice was Jesus. So when we read through the whole Old Testament, we look at uh, the lambs and the animals that were sacrificed and the scapegoats, all these things, they were pointing to our Savior, Jesus. And so because of that sacrifice, that day, we no longer have to get blood on our hands. We no longer have to kill animals. I asked some of the high schoolers, what, why are you glad you don't have to do this? They're like, because I don't want to kill animals, Right? We no longer have to do those things because Jesus sacrificed his body for us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for sending your son to die for us. Jesus, thank you for the sacrifice that you made on the cross. Giving your body for us. Taking our punishment for sin. And giving us your righteousness. It is something that we will have eternal gratitude for. We will sing your praises forever and ever. And Father, at this time, as we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made, I pray that we will do so with excitement, understanding that we no longer have to make those sacrifices. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
and he broke it and gave, gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 20 of Luke 22 reads, And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. See, not only do we not have to participate in those sacrifices of the Old Testament because a body was sacrificed already, but because we now have a new covenant. The blood that he shed for us has now given us this new covenant that we are saved by grace. And it is through Jesus Christ and faith in him that we can receive that grace. So I, I pray that uh, as you go through this week, meditate on those things. Be grateful that we don't have to have these sacrifices. Be grateful that we are under a new covenant. It is by grace that you are saved through faith. Father, thank you for this new covenant. Thank you that Jesus met all the requirements and standards to satisfy you. Lord, I pray as we take this cup that we will do so with a, a, a celebration that we are under this new covenant, but also a recognition that is all done through Jesus Christ since we have an attitude of gratitude towards it. And it's in Jesus' name, amen. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the lord's death until he comes amen amen, amen. all right I would just make a transition to the back row. <laughs> uh, one reminder that I do want to uh, put out there by way of announcement is we still need people and we need you to fill out these uh, ministry opportunity signups. Um, we had very few signups. I think I had saw maybe a couple more on the desk. And so uh, if you know where you want to serve or if you're already serving in a place, please inform us. Please fill this out. 
Um, I know Levon had mentioned to me that we had zero people sign up for the missions team. Uh, and that's not good, right? We need people. We, we, we need uh, people to help support our missionaries and to uh, be in contact with them. And so if that's something that you're interested in, uh, please sign up. Uh, give us this today. Um, that way we can kind of contact you, give the, the information that you need. You can plan meetings, uh, things like that. So that was just one quick thing I had by way of announcement. But we're going to get back into 2 Peter today. Woo! What? No celebration? <laughs> um, I guess, it, and I also should say this, I, I guess, uh, we, uh, yesterday we had my basketball team's last game of the season, um, and so we ended up losing uh, by two points. Yeah, it was, it was a rough game, um, but we ended up losing by two points. The only downside, well, I mean, other than losing, I guess, um, was it was out in Grand Junction, so we had a four-hour drive home of just sitting there thinking about it. And so I talked to the other coach, and he's like, man, this is the worst drive after a game ever. Because usually it's like 40 minutes at the most, usually. Uh, but this was a four-hour one where you're just sitting there, and the, it was dead quiet in the van. I mean, no one was saying anything. Um, as opposed to when we were driving out there, you know, I had to be like, calm down back there. What are you doing? You know, keep your shoes on, whatever. Um, it was a very drastically different thing. And so, uh, but also the Lord protected us. Uh, I did have to call a few people Saturday morning saying like, hey, so there's a very small but possibility that the Vail Pass could be closed and I may not actually be able to get home tonight. Um, and so I had to kind of prepare and, and work around that. But the Lord uh, held back the snow long enough to where I was able to get back and we're able to be here today. So um, praise God for that. So we're going to continue our study of 2 Peter. 2 Peter. And we are still in chapter 1. Still in chapter 1. Uh, and you're like, man, how are you going to do this in four weeks? Well, by the grace of God. Um, <laughs> but we got two more chapters, so the next couple of weeks we will cover those chapters. Uh, and those chapters as a whole, uh, they really, they can be summed up in, in, in messages. Uh, and so we'll be doing that. But today we're going to finish up chapter 1. Okay, so we're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 12 is where we're going to be. Uh, but last week, we looked at the importance of having a knowledge of our faith. We looked at an importance of having knowledge of our faith, right? And this isn't knowledge that we just have as intellect, but it is knowledge that has been gained through experience. It's a faith that we understand and know because we practice it. We live by uh, the standards that, that, that we have here. And so what we, what we talked about was that our spiritual growth and a godly life were indicators on where we were in our spiritual knowledge. See, a greater understanding of our faith will have, will have greater spiritual growth. We'll have a godly life. So we talked about how we needed to be growing in the knowledge of our faith because that is one of the best defenses we have against false teachers. If we're growing spiritually, if we're living a godly life, when these false teachers come, we'll be aware of it, right? We'll say, well, no, I'm living by God's standard, so I know that what you are teaching is not accurate. We won't have a lot of confusion. But today we're going to look at our second defense against false teachers that Peter gives us in this passage, and that's knowledge of the word. Knowledge of the word. So let's begin reading in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses tw starting in verse 12. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it right, as long as I am in, in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able to, at any time to recall these things. Verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we, had, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the, maj by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice, born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain." And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, 
but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Father, thank you for your word. Father, I pray as we open it up today that we will learn from it and that we will learn the importance of it. Holy Spirit, please instruct us in the ways that we ought to to live our lives through this word. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so the first thing we're going to look at, first point today, is that the word will outlive men. The word will outlive men. So verse 12 through 15, Therefore I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. So Peter wanted to remind his readers of the things that we discussed last week. Right? That's why in verse 12 it says, therefore, right? Therefore is referring to the things that were before that. So therefore, I intend always to remind you. He wanted to remind us that our faith was in a person. He wanted to remind us that our faith will produce spiritual growth. And that spiritual growth will produce practical results. Right? Those are the, 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 the points that we had last week. But why did he want to remind them of these things? He even says in those verses that, he, that, they, that they know them and in fact are established in them. Why did he want to remind them of them? One thing that I've heard, and, and I've heard from different sermons, but I've also heard uh, outside the church context, that familiarity breeds contempt. Becoming familiar with something can breed contempt towards that, or at least uh, an uncaring idea towards it. Now, <laughs> this leading into what I'm about to say doesn't really apply, but it does, does apply, right? So I have an awesome wife. You're like, what? Are you saying you have contempt for her now? No, 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 no. I have an awesome wife, okay? But there's sometimes that I forget and probably don't appreciate her as much as I should. Because there's, there's times that she'll do something or she'll tell me about how her day at work went or she'll, she'll uh, provide and, and make some, whatever it is, and I'm just amazed by it. And I'm like, why am I always amazed? Like, you know, it's like I already know she's pretty cool. Another reminder that we have, right, is, is communion today. I was thinking about how often that we do communion, okay? So here at Trinity, we do it once a month, right? We try to do it the first Sunday of the month. And I was trying to think over my, over my lifetime, right, over 29 years of life, how many times I have done communion. And I don't know that answer. But I did a little bit of math, all right? And so I'm just assuming what we do here at church, okay? I've done communion at least 252 times, at least. Even, even last month, I did communion twice, right? And so I'm sure there was definitely times where I did communion more than once a month, and so it was at least 252 times. Can communion become repetitive? I think at some places, probably. It can be very liturgical, right? You kind of stand and sit and do this and take, right? I know, I know some uh, churches may be like that. Whenever I do communion, I try to change it up. I, I, I get excited about doing communion, uh, and, and I want people to not feel like, oh, we're doing the bread and cup thing today. I want people to understand, hey, this is what this means. This is the importance of it, and I want you to be excited about it every single time. But the reason why I try to change it up and make it exciting or, or uh, at least maybe come at it from a different point of view every time is for this exact reason. Because we can go over it, we can do these things so many times that eventually it becomes knowledge, we understand what it is, and it's sort of in our head. But that's all it is. It's not an excitement. So Peter wanted to remind them. He says, I know that you know these things already. I know that you know them. But I am compelled to tell them again because I know my time on earth is coming to a close. And I need to know that you will remember them when I'm gone. See, Peter had this, this compulsion to do this because the Spirit laid it on him. But also he knew, yes, you know these things, but it's greater than just a knowledge. We need to experience, we need to actually practice these things in our life. 
So a question I want to ask you guys, right? What is one thing that I will have in common with Martin Luther, John Calvin, C.S. Lewis, Billy Graham? They're all dead. <laughs> and I too one day will die, right? Yes, someone said salvation, right? Yes, I, <laughs> that's another thing. I'm sure there's some other great things that I will have with those men, right, in common. Uh, but I know for a fact, one thing for sure is that I will die as well. Peter knew that his time was short because Jesus had told him when he would die. In John 21, verse 18 through 19, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do, where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death uh, he was to glorify God. And pay attention to verse 19 at the end. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. I love at the end of that verse, it says, follow me. How many of you, if you were to find out how and when you were going, going to die, right? Maybe you would have excitement at the beginning because you're like, man, that's a little ways down the road. But as time grew closer, Jesus still says, follow me. So what he gave them is also what we have received. And that's the word of God. Peter's reminder here in, in the words that he writes is the word of God. We have it in our Bible today. See, men will die. Our traditions will die. The institutions that we've set up and put all of our, our life and, and money into will eventually die and fade away. But this word will not die. This word will last forever. So Peter's desire was led by the Holy Spirit to give us this word so that we will have it for generations to come. Going back to 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1, 24 to 25, it says, For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory is like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. See, we're not there. Peter isn't alive right now. He's not the one preaching this message. But we have his words. And ultimately, we have the Spirit's words because the Spirit is what spoke through him. So this word still has power. This word still saves. The word still transformed lives. And the word is still relevant. And it will be forever. So that's the first point. The first point uh, that we need to have knowledge of the word, right? We need to understand that it will outlive all men. The second point is that the word will outlast exper all experiences. The word will outlast all experiences. Verse 16, it, it reads uh, through 18, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, uh, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We, are, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. So the world around us really runs on experience. Really runs on experiences, okay? Uh, and there's a couple, a couple things that uh, I'll, I'll point out that sort of have that, at least in our own lives, right? How many of you know who Dave Matthews Band is? Anybody? Okay. There's a, there's a few. I don't agree with everything they say, and I don't agree with every song they sing, but there's something about Dave Matthews Band music that I, I just I love. It, it's, it's so different, okay? It's, it's, it's catchy, right? I'm sure my wife is sick of it because I listen to it a lot. Uh, people refer to it as elevator music, and I was like, well, uh, I want to go on those elevators, right? That sounds like a fun elevator. Well, something that I was reading, okay, so, so, you know, Google follows everybody, right? It's always listening, always knows where we're at. And so there was some articles that popped up about Dave Matthews Band. And something I read that caught my eye was an article on whether Dave Matthews Band was actually good or not. I was like, oh, that's interesting, right? And so I began to read through it, and, and, and the conclusion to this article was like, uh, they're, 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 they were pretty good, but they actually never met their full potential. They could have changed things and gone and, and been better. I was like, no, because like, that's what everyone else does. Everyone else goes to what the main people want. Well, you know, I had all this disagreement with it. 
okay? But one thing that stuck out to me was that what they mentioned. It said, in the 90s, to go to, the, to a Dave Matthews band was an experience that you wanted to go to, whether you liked the band or not. It was an experience that, that some people just said that, they, that they, they had. Right? Oh, I went to a Dave Matthews band concert last night. Another, an experience that I want in my own life, and something when people ask me what's on your bucket list, the one thing that I usually always tell them is I want to go to Antarctica. And usually they're like, huh? And they're like, why do you want to go to Antarctica? And my answer is to tell people that I've been to Antarctica. That's it, right? I know there's nothing there. It's a snow wasteland, right? There's a few hundred scientists. Maybe their labs are kind of cool. I don't know. I probably don't understand it. But there's no meaningful significance. The only thing is I got to experience it, and how many other people get to experience that? See, this world is, is centered on experiences. Much of my generation, they, they, they grow up and they tell you, you don't need a house, let's just travel the world. That's experience. The world around you will try to tell you, hey, try this new drug or feel this experience. The experience is so great. They may even say, hey, you need to be open-minded when it comes to your relationships and when it comes to sex. It's an experience we all need to have. Unfortunately, many people's faith is based on experience. See, they, they may say, I'm going to believe in God because I had a close encounter with a death experience. That's where their faith is drawn from. Or maybe they had a vision or a dream of Jesus, and now they believe in him as my Savior. See, experiences can be good things, okay? So when I say, you know, someone's getting saved, they had a dream and vision, I'm not saying that those are wrong or bad things. See, experiences are good things. In fact, Jesus healed many people that then believed in him as the Son of God, and it was that experience of the healing that drew them. But when the basis of our faith is on an experience itself, we will lose faith when we aren't experiencing it anymore. When you have that excitement and the experience of the, the moment, once that moment's gone, our faith has no base anymore. What we read in here is that Peter had one of the greatest experiences any of us could ever hope for. These verses are centered on the transfiguration of Jesus. And I can't even imagine what that's like. Right? When we read the passages in, 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 in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and we, we look at the, the, the description here, that would, that's a, an amazing experience. Right? He got to visually see Jesus receiving honor and glory from God. He got confirmation that Jesus was the one that fulfilled prophecy, that he was the one that fulfilled what the prophets were saying, right? Moses and Elijah were there confirming that. He also got confirmation that he, in fact, was the Son of God. God said it himself. And it was also a reminder that those that believe in him as their Savior will receive his righteousness and this kingdom to come. He got to see Jesus in this state. But the only problem with this is that it was Peter's experience. It wasn't our experience. We weren't there. Peter and a couple disciples, that was it. But the amazing thing is that we can still receive the same proof that Jesus is who he says he is because of the word. Peter wrote out this experience, and we can now have that confirmation in the word. We put our faith in God, not because of the experience that we may receive, but because of the word that we have received. As we're going to look in, in, in the next week, right, about false prophets and teachers, we will see that they devise myths and tricks, and, and they trick many people to believe in them, right? And many people someday, they might have these deeper spiritual experiences, whatever that means. But one thing we need to understand about experience is that experience can be interpreted differently between individuals. But the word of God has one clear message. We can forget and distort all our memories of an experience, right? I had that from our, my basketball game last night. Talking to some people afterwards, I was like, you did not see that the way I saw that. Even though we were at the same event, we can distort things in our memory about it, but the word of God remains forever. 
So be careful of spiritual exper experiences, right? One thing we need to do with those is we need to make sure that they align with Scripture. They have to align with Scripture, right? We get the eternal word that surpasses all experiences and is in fact the standard for our experience. Okay, I know I've heard stories of, of men uh, in, in, in foreign countries that have, they maybe had a vision or a dream of Jesus, right? And eventually they, began, they, they, be, they uh, became saved through that, but it was always a missionary had brought the word to them. So if our standard for an experience is based on scripture, we will know what is true and what is not true. So that was the second point. The second point is that the word will outlast all experiences. And the third point is this, the word outshines all darkness. The word outshines all the darkness of the word. Verse 19 through 21. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy has, was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Uh, is the world around us getting worse? Yeah, yeah I, I heard a bunch of yeses. What about scientifically? What about health? People are living longer now than, not, not according to the Old Testament, right? But they're living longer now than they did 100 years ago. What about technology? We can communicate to people overseas like that, right? If we want to go to somewhere in the world, we can travel there in under eight hours probably, right? But see, we know it's getting darker because of sin. So when, we, when I asked the question, is it getting worse, most of our minds went to, yeah, sin's getting darker, yes. But when we explain it to a world that doesn't understand it that way, our explanation is futile. They're like, no, the world's not getting worse. In fact, it's getting better. Actually, we're trying to, to fix the wrongs that we did in the past. Right? We're being very progressive with this. We're, we're progressing forward. So if you tell the world that, it, if you try to tell them that it's getting darker, they'll disagree. The only way for the world to understand that it is in darkness is by showing them the light. That's the only way they'll understand. So there's a few things that we point out uh, that the world shines with, okay? Or that the word, sorry, shines with. Okay, the word shines because it is sure. This was in verse 19, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. The word of God has been proven true over and over and over again. What we saw with the transfiguration was a confirmation of that word. All right, I mentioned these earlier. The prophets predicted a suffering Savior. Those same prophets were on the mountain with Jesus. God confirmed Jesus' calling. Right, he said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. It also spoke of his future glory that will eventually come, right? Jesus received this glory, and we, and we were shown the glory that he would receive. Psalm 19, verse 7 reads, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Our word is sure. It is confirmed. How many of you have ever read uh, maybe a cultist religious document? Maybe a book, maybe a pamphlet. Nobody? Ah, oh, I was a trip. Yeah, yeah, good. I mean, well, not good, but, you know, I've, I've looked at them to see, man, what are, what are they talking about? What are they doing? Right? Verse 16 tells us that they will have cleverly devised myths. And when you read those things, you're like, ooh, that's pretty clever, right? Man, if I, wasn't, if I didn't have the spirit of truth within me right now, that would probably... Take me on a rabbit trail and to believe in it. But what we do know is that those cleverly devised myths lead to death. That's where their ending is. Our word is the only one that is true. It's the only one that is sure. It is the only one that, in fact, brings life. And to show the world how dark it is, they need to see that truth. They need to see that our word is sure. The second thing is that the word shines 
because it is our guiding lamp. The word shines because it is our guide. The word's dark place here means murky. Right, how many of you have been to a swamp? Like maybe in Florida, or I don't know if there's any swamps around here. I don't feel like there are, but it's like a murky or, or a moldy old cellar. How many of you have been to one of those? Hopefully it was by choice, I guess, right? <laughs> That's what these words are referring to. The, wor- the, the world was such a beautiful place when God created it. Right? The Garden of Eden, it was all perfect. But because of sin, we now see that it's become a dark, murky place. Yes, in a physical sense, it still shows the beauty and the glory of God. All right, Romans talks about that. It points to nature as, uh, as an indicator that there is God. But we, in fact, know that it is still filled with death and decay. But the world, more so than the physical side, the world is lost. And it's lost like it's someone stranded in a swamp in the middle of the night. If you guys were stranded in the dark, in a swamp in the middle of the night, what's one thing that you would probably want to help? Some light, right? It's the Word. The Word is a lamp that will lead us out of that swamp. Psalms 119 verse 105 says, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This Word is our guide. So if we want to lead people out of the dark, murky world that they are trapped in, we need to have that guide. In the Bible, we're also referred to as the light of the world. But we must let our light shine, and we need to let our light shine in the darkness. But our brightness is determined by how strong we are holding on to the word. Philippians 2, 14 through 16 reads, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. We hold fast to the word of life, and when we are asked about that light, we tell them to Jesus and we point to our lamp. We point them to the guide, which is the word. It is the only thing that can lead this murky world out of its darkness. So that's the second way that the word outshines darkness is that is our guide. The third one is that our word, the word shines because it is spirit given. Verse 20, knowing that, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from one's, someone's own interpretation for no prophecy has ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So we don't trust in the works of men. Now, there are some amazing authors out there. There are some great defenders of our faith, some awesome literature. Uh, as I'm getting older and, 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 and reading more, the more I'm beginning to understand this, that there are some awesome defenders of our faith, and they have some, written some great things. But one thing that we can find is that books will have mistakes. People, the authors of these books, will make mistakes. We'll see that some awesome books will need a new edition to be made because when you read it, you don't understand what's happening because it's not relevant anymore. But our book, the Word, is infallible. It is living. And the reason being is because it is written by the Spirit. It says the hands of men moved by the Spirit like a ship being carried by the wind. What we're going to see in the next chapter is that false teachers will have false words and they'll twist scripture to meet their own greedy desires. Right? They will make scripture say what they want it to say because they will not take the whole book as a whole. They'll say, doesn't the Bible say this? And they'll take like part of a verse. They twist it to say what they want. But because it is spirit written, it also needs to be spirit taught. We must allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, to teach it to us properly, knowing that the world does not have the spirit of truth within them. See, some may, be, may claim to be spirit-led, but how do they align with Scripture? What we have to understand is that the spirit will not contradict itself. So yes, I feel like the spirit is leading me to do these things, and you're like, well, the, the Bible says not to do that. It's like, I must have a new revelation. I don't think so. 
The Spirit is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is God. So we don't have to be taught by only spiritual leaders, and that's one thing that's awesome about the Bible, right? The, the church, and in, in, especially in England, right, that was one thing that they, they, they wanted control of, is we want to control what is taught in the Bible. That's why the early years of making the English Bible was, was a difficult history. They wanted to control it. But this word, this book is written for everyday man. Okay, when Peter is writing this, right, he doesn't say written to those that are, uh, have shown themselves to be spiritually in authority or to those that are better than the other people that are below them. No, it says to those that obtained a faith of equal standing. That's you and me. See, it's written for everyday man. So that's one of the reasons that, that we can understand that this word will shine in this world because it's not written by men. It is written by the Spirit. It is guided by the Spirit. So my closing question for you today is, how are you treating the Word? One of the greatest offenses we have against false teachers is knowledge of this book, knowledge of the Word. How is your knowledge of the Word? We must always be prepared and not think that we will get it, understand the book right when the time arises. We need to prepare now. Those that fall asleep and don't stay alert or prepared will be taken over by the enemy. So we must have knowledge of the faith and of the word today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is uh, eternal, that it will outlive every man here. Thank you that it will last, outlast all experiences that we may ever have. Thank you that it outshines all the darkness in the world, that it is our guide. Lord, I pray that we would take it seriously. And as we look into the next chapter, as we see these false teachers and what they look like and what their message is, that we would know how to fight against it because we have knowledge of the faith and we have knowledge of your word. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so uh, I think we're going to have him. He's going to walk around with a microphone, okay? Uh, so if you are wanting to share something, whether it's a praise, whether it's a prayer request, um, anything along those lines, just slip up your hand, right, high enough where Tim can see you, uh, and he will maybe run. I don't know. You want to run, Tim? No, I didn't think so. <laughs> uh, he'll, he'll get over there as soon as he can, and so uh, go ahead. Hi. Hi. Um... Several of you have already shared the story, and in a little bit more detail, I'll shorten it up a little bit. Uh, about a week and a half ago on Wednesday night, my wife, who's been not the best of health for quite a while, uh, she got up and she was staggering around, and she bumped the bed a little bit, and it woke me up. And she says, "I asked." She was okay, and she wanted to go use the bathroom, and that uh, she needed help. So I helped her in and got her in there. She just collapsed, and I got her laid on the floor, and uh, she was just as white as a sheet of paper, and her body was, had turned cold. I thought she was dead, and I cried out to God, and just in a matter of seconds from, you know, when I started praying, her eyes opened up, and she and I talked, said a few words, and I got a blanket and covered her and snuggled with her until she got warm so she could get back to bed. And uh, like I say, God answers prayer. And like Steve told me, he said, you didn't call 911 first and use God as a backup plan. He went to God first. Let 911 be the backup. Thank you. So, anyway. Amen. She's doing much better now, I think. Good morning. Um, I've been, when I go to bed, oftentimes God gives me some, I believe, <laughs> some powerful powerful um, experiences. One of them, that, and this may sound pretty simple, but 
I, I was thinking about the Bible very simply says love your wives well if we as believers would love our wives we could change this church the nation would change if if we would when our when our life wife doesn't doing isn't doing something we think we should do that they should do we love our wives when when they're not taking care of us or, or, or meeting some of the needs we think they should love our wives you know it just every moment of every day if if we would love our wives as as Christ has leads us to do it could transform marriages it could transform our 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 church and it could transform our nation <laughs> it, it, I know it's simple but I th I think profoundly it's true <laughs> Amen I, and this has nothing to do with what he's saying <laughs> even though I am his wife um, I got a call from Irma um, this morning because she wasn't going to make it to prayer meeting I mean to our war room and I think I should pray, share this with you guys one of our missionaries that we support here at Trinity is Dennis Noble and he fell off a ladder this week mm. and he uh, if I can read this he, he broke his pelvis and fractured many other including his sternum, his upper arm, his wrist, knuckles in both hands, some vertebrae, and he bit all the way through his tongue. Okay, but Irma said, praise the Lord that he, none of his internal organs were injured. So that's a praise. And also praise the Lord for a stranger that called 911 because he was home by himself. So if you would, you know, we need to pray for Dennis Noble's recovery, mm. please. And also one other missionary we have, we support the Mutchlers and Karen and Bill were in Thailand, just gotten back to Thailand, needed to pass a COVID test. And we got the prayer request shot out through email that she was sick and uh, had to go to the hospital because she was, you know, really in bad shape. And so she went to the hospital, is on a couple of antibiotics for some infections she had. But the next day they, they got the results back from the COVID test and they were, pos they were negative, so they're good to go. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Was that, uh, those prayer requests written on the prayer sheet? Is that what you were reading from? Yes. They are? Okay. Uh, I, I've been told they are. The nobles are, yes. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I encourage you as you leave today to take one of those um, and pray, pray for them throughout the week. Um, pray for our missionaries. Pray for those that are in need and, and hurting. Hi, everybody. I have a praise report about my niece, Sammy, Maxine's um, granddaughter. She was in a horrible rollover accident three, three weekends ago. She broke her back, her L3 and 4, broke her ribs, punctured lung, pretty, pretty beat up, or some brain trauma. Anyway, I believe because of all the prayer that has gone out for her, the surgeon says she doesn't need um, a rod put in her spine. He believes that if, there's, if there was any place to break your spine where it was broken was the best spot ever that could heal on its own. So because of the prayer and, and just everybody getting on their knees constantly and all the rehab also, we believe she's going to continue to walk and get back to normal. It's going to be a long road ahead, but um, she's doing it. And this grandma hasn't left her side, <laughs> except for today. <laughs> she's in trouble. Anyway, thank you all. And I'd love, also like to thank all of you for praying for my family with the loss of my granddaughter about a month and a half ago. Um, prayer has kept, uh, kept us going forward. I just pray that you continue praying for my daughter, Shannon, because it's tough. Thank you. Sammy. 
And Sammy's mother was in almost the same exact accident three years before and had a lot worse injuries, but she's walking and she had a lot of surgery, but she's, she's doing as well as can be expected. Thank you. Everybody has mentioned um, the power of prayer this morning. And um, for the life of me, I cannot um, understand how people who don't know our Lord make it through life. Um, you all have prayed a lot for my family, um, starting with Matt Carroll passing away and then um, Mike's two brothers. He lost both of his brothers in less than two months. And um, it's been a very hard time emotionally. And we wouldn't have got through it without prayer, without the Lord, and without our family. And so um, I just want to thank you all. And, and I'm a testament also for the power of prayer. Don't know how people do it without it. I just want to thank all of you guys for your prayers for my husband. He is my superman. <laughs> he uh, is so far ahead of what the doctors expected him to be at this point after surgery. He's home. He had no rehab. He's not using a walker. He's not on oxygen. I mean, amazing. He went to the doctor Wednesday with no walker, no oxygen, nothing got 76 staples removed and he is doing awesome and I know it's all thanks to the Lord and you guys' prayers. I, I couldn't have got through this without any of you guys and I need you to know that. Uh giving us an update on some of the, the prayer requests that we've been praying for and um, those praises. Uh, we have so much to be thankful for. Um, and we continue to pray and we continue to, to seek God's will and, and healing and, and, and uh, just providing in different situations. We also thank him for protection that we receive. Um, he's just so good to us. So I'm going to close in prayer and we will be dismissed. Father God, the fact that you will listen to us and hear our prayers is such an awesome thing. That we can enter your presence in a time of prayer, Lord, and that we can do so confidently, knowing that you are aware of our needs, that you have care for us, that you're not uh, just so thrown away or, or away from us. You experience these things through Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that those of, uh, that are not here, uh, if they uh, just weren't able to make it safely, or if they're doing, uh, if they're unwell, Lord, that you'll bring healing to them, that you'll be with them. Father, we thank you for how good you are to us, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. And John